So, uh, yeah, Sharon and I are going to be doing a joint presentation because this is a project that we worked jointly on. And um, I think it's, well, it follows on beautifully, I think, from um, Naomi's talk because this absolutely is a benefit of letting, not so much a student researcher, but as a researcher um, into your collections and, um, and what can come out of it. Uh, so our presentation is about our work with um, the Bateman Collection um, at um, Sheffield Museums and wider and the development of the next exhibition uh, that we ended up calling Brought to Light. And the project's been a really long time in the making. Um, here are some items from the Bateman Collection. I will tell you about more about that in a minute. Um, so, so as I said, it's been a very long time in the making and it's developed quite organically. Um, Sharon um, had been regularly visiting the museum store to do research into the Bateman collection. And we had to think about when was it, but I started at Sheffield in 2015 and she was already one of those people who regularly came to research. Um, <laughs> and because she was so wonderful, we welcomed her back two or three times a year. So, you know... Um, and we started, you know, went out over coffee and that sort of thing. You start talking about, wouldn't it be great um, to put on an exhibition about the Bateman Collection? And this idea coincided neatly with the fact that 2021 would mark the 200th anniversary of Thomas Bateman's birth. But of course, uh, COVID had other ideas, which is why we ended up opening the exhibition 201 years after he was born instead. So just to tell you a little bit about uh, Thomas Bateman, um, he was born in 1821 and he was a Victorian antiquarian and a pioneer of early archaeology. Sorry, um, He excavated many hundreds of Bronze Age and Anglo-Saxon um, burial mounds in the Peak District um, and he sponsored other people's excavations, especially in North Yorkshire and in Staffordshire. He was a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and I think a founding member, possibly, of the British Archaeological Association. Um, and he, uh, his father was also interested in archaeology, his father William Bateman, um, but he died when Thomas was only 13, um, so he was brought up by his grandfather, uh, also called Thomas. Um, by the end of this project, I was slightly sick of the name Thomas, he put Thomas Bateman, his grandfather Thomas Bateman, his son Thomas Bateman, his cousin Thomas, and many, many, many 19th century men appeared to be called Thomas. And it doesn't help that my father is called Thomas and my brother-in-law is Thomas, so, you know, you can't get away from them. It's a good name, though. Um, <laughs> and so William had excavated several local burial mounds and he had a small collection of archaeological material. Um, and then these objects were passed to uh, Thomas after William's death and they formed the basis of Thomas's own collections. And he went and re-excavated many of the burial mounds that William had excavated. So what made him different to his contemporaries um, was that he recorded and published his excavations. Um, so uh, he wrote long descriptions of um, the excavations and then published those in books. And he also um, illustrated them. So these are some of his own illustrations of... Um, excavation sites. Um, between 1843 and 1861, he excavated over 200 burial mounds, uh, which named, uh, earned him the nickname the Barrow Knight, because they're also known as Barrows. Um, and he left little lead plaques in the uh, burial mounds that he excavated, um, you know, so that people would know he had been there. And I can't say whether this is arrogant or you know, he was modest because he didn't mind that they had been um, misspelt his name on it, um, on these plaques. Um, so we have some of these plaques in the collection. Um, as well as his own illustrations, um, he uh, got his friend Llewellyn Dewitt to paint watercolours of many of the objects in the collection. And was def Dewitt was definitely a better artist than uh, Bateman himself. And... Um, they were gathered together in, this, in a publication in a book called Relics of Primeval Life, uh, and, and so many, many beautiful uh, pictures. In the middle is um, Dewitt's illustration of a um, Bronze Age jet necklace that was excavated at, at Grindlow um, in 1849, and on the right is a recent photograph of the same objects in our collection, and we have many, many of these where you've got the original illustration, and in some cases... Um, 
you can see how things have changed over the years or how conservation has revealed um, new details and things like that. He uh, built, had, or had this built, this house built, Lombardale House in Milton by Yulgrave in Derbyshire, where, which he used to house his, um, his museum, uh, to house his collection. Um, and in 1856, he had to enlarge the house as his collection had expanded so much. And again, I can't decide whether he was a genius, surrounded by all these amazing things, or whether his wife and um, five children suffered greatly because of dad's obsession with archaeology and collecting. Um, so, uh, again, they weren't a very long-linked family, apart from Thomas, the grandfather. Uh, Thomas Bateman himself died age 39, um, and the collection was inherited by Thomas William, the son, who was only nine at the time. Um, but by the time Thomas William reached um, adulthood, the family fortunes, the money was very much depleted, um, and so he decided to let out Lombardale House, and in order to, fac to facilitate this, he loaned um, a large part of the collection, or a part of the collection, to Western Park Museum in Sheffield that had opened the year previously. So this was in 1876 he loaned it. Um, and then, but eventually um, he decided or was forced to sell off the entire collection um, in 1893. And at that point is when Sheffield bought um, the items, the collection that they had on loan. So. He is very well um, known, uh, and Sharon's going to tell you more about that dispersal. So, um, and that Bateman collection of local archaeology and of objects and archival papers, it still forms the core of Sheffield's archaeology collection, and it's of national significance. Um, as you can imagine, the Peak District is now a national park, um, so you don't get rich people going out at weekends and digging up bur burial mounds. Um, so those historic uh, excavations are often the only excavations that may have been done of those areas. Um, and he, so he's a very well-known figure in Derbyshire and Yorkshire archaeological circles as a prolific excavator and a collector. Um, and um, we've always known that he didn't just collect archaeology. Um, but through this project, we've discovered really how wide his interests um, are and also that it's not just archaeology within the collections at Sheffield. We also have, you know, we always imagined, oh, it's mostly archaeology with a few bits of natural science. Um, and actually, we've discovered so much with this collection that we've had for, you know, nearly 150 years, we've found so much out. Um, and this exhibition has really been our opportunity to be able to, to share that. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Sharon, who will tell you about her involvement in the project, and then later on, I will uh, show you some pictures of the exhibition because I know everybody always likes to see those. Thank you. Um, so, uh, sorry. Uh, my research into the Bateman collection was initially unintentional. Um, I happened upon the Bateman name whilst working on a project with Manchester Art Gallery, researching their Mary Gregg collection of handicrafts of bygone times. Numerous items in that collection bore a Bateman collection label, and curiosity led me to Sheffield. Uh, letters from Mary Gregg to the Guild of St. George revealed a family connection. Uh, this is Mary Gregg here, and her father, uh, Thomas Arthur Hope, yeah, was Thomas Bateman's cousin. Um, so I moved seamlessly, really, from investigating one collection to another. It was a very organic process. I was interested in Thomas Bateman as a collector rather than an archaeologist, but whilst he was there in the margins of many publications, I couldn't find answers to specific questions. How big was the collection? How did he acquire things and why? Uh, and in more recent publications, such as Susan Pierce's seminal work published in 1992, Bateman warranted only half a sentence and was inaccurately referred to as Thomas Bateman of Sheffield. Um, so perplexed, um, I took a deep dive into the archive to see what I could find in Bateman's archaeological correspondence, his museum accounts books, 
uh, which I had transcribed during lockdown, uh, and the sales catalogues that detailed the dispersal of the collection in 1893. And what I could see was that in its day, the Bateman Collection was pioneering and considered one of the best private museums in the country. Bateman was one of the first private collectors to publish a printed and illustrated catalogue of his collection in 1855, and this shows that he was an early adopter of the free age system, and his excavated material was broadly organised into chronological periods of stone, bronze and iron, which was several years before the British Museum followed suit. Although a private museum, the collection was accessible and used as a resource by scholars in the pursuit of knowledge. In the late 1850s, for example, Bateman allowed the craniologists Joseph Barnard Davis and John Thurnham to study his extensive collection of human remains. Uh, according to Deborah Harlan, they analysed at least 50 scrolls from Bateman's collection and the resulting data contributed to the production of Crania Britannica, 1856-1865, the first publication to study British skull types from prehistory to the Anglo-Saxon period. Although at the time this was considered an important work, which contributed to mid-19th century debate about race and ethnology, uh, craniology was used to support controversial racist theories, which, it's important to note, have since been shown to be without foundation. In fact, Bateman artifacts have been used to inform numerous publications, such as The Life of Josiah Wedgwood, written by Eliza Metyard in 1863. Items from Bateman's ceramics collection were used to illustrate several chapters in the book. So the collection was used by others and enjoyed a much higher profile uh, than it does today. Bateman's archaeological correspondence began to reveal his broader network and connections and showed that he was held in esteem by his peers. The archive holds ten volumes of letters sent to Thomas Bateman between 1844 and 1859. These abound in datal and alphabetical order according to the writer. This rich resource was invaluable in both filling the gaps and opening up further lines of inquiry. Unfortunately, few letters exist written by Bateman, so conversations are one-sided and his voice is absent from the debate. The letters show that he was regularly consulted on archaeological and antiquarian matters. Sam Anderson wrote to him in July 1853, asking for his opinion on an unusual flint he had stumbled across. The letters also reveal a vibrant collecting and trading network as Bateman procured artifacts and books from dealers across the UK, Ireland and into Europe. From the London antiquary, William Chaffers, he acquired the rare Mexican headdress that remains the only such example in the British Museum's collection of turquoise mosaics. Bateman also purchased directly and indirectly from sales. Here, Chaffers is suggesting he purchased Lot 1, a square glass bottle, from a Sotheby's sale. Lots 21 and 24, he adds, are of course work, not fine enough for you which suggests that Bateman was an astute buyer. The most consistent correspondent is Charles Roach Smith, the London collector and co-founder of the British Archaeological Association, and it appears that he and Bateman shared a long and close friendship. Roach Smith procured many items for Bateman's collection from the London digs, writing to him in January 1845. I'm about to send off by the railway, as usual, a box of antiquities and other things. The vase, which is almost perfect, came from Friday Street. Artifacts matching this and other fine sites he mentions have been traced to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, Cambridge, adding new knowledge to contemporary museum databases. His letters are peppered with thumbnail sketches of artifacts intended for Bateman. 
The museum accounts books enable the true scale and range of the collection to be appreciated, particularly beyond 1855. Bateman continued purchasing for another six years after the publication of the catalogue, and there are approximately 250 pages crammed full of new acquisitions listed at the end of each week. The late 1850s shows Bateman at his most active period of purchasing, and whilst he carried on acquiring archaeological items, he placed greater emphasis on broadening the scope of his collection. During this time, his ethnographic collection more than doubled. In the two weeks before his death alone, he acquired 50 artifacts covering Asia, Africa, North and South America, and Oceania, so this was a growing area of interest. His pottery collection grew fivefold. Uh, the slipware dish was purchased in October 1855, the posset pot in January 1858, and the decorated plate was one of a pair purchased in May the same year. None of these items was recorded in the 1855 catalogue, and for many artifacts in a similar position, this would ultimately result in loss of bait and provenance. Bateman's inherited wealth amplified his purchasing power, and he acquired objects of greater prestige and value, including the stunning gilt and ivory trio book covers, which are now in the John Ryland's collection. At £257, approximately £28,000 today, this was his most expensive individual purchase. Indeed, his collection of ivory carvings was so esteemed he was invited to show these at the Art Treasures of Great Britain exhibition held at Manchester in 1857. Sadly, at the height of building his collection, Thomas Bateman died after a short illness in August 1861, aged only 39. His obituary noted that he was of European fame and his museum accounts books are littered with artifacts and authored works gifted by scholars across Europe and into America. In the early months of 1861 alone, he received publications from Ferdinand Zirkel, a German professor of geology, the archaeologist and numismatist John Evans, and the ethnologist Dr. James Aitken Meigs of Philadelphia, reflecting not only the breadth of his interests, but also his standing amongst his peers. So this is anything but a regional collection of locally excavated artifacts. It is little wonder then that when the collection came up for auction in 1893, it attracted the fevered attention of some of the leading collectors, curators and dealers of the day. General Pitt Rivers or his representative purchased well over 100 objects for his museum displays at Farnham, where they were used to stimulate public interest in early British and prehistoric culture. Some of these items would later be moved on to Salisbury Museum, where they remain today. Five separate sales took place across April, May and June of 1893. So extensive was the collection and library. One final sale took place in October 1895, following the death of Bateman's heir, Thomas William. Here, the Greg name appears against a lot of three items now found in the Bygones collection at Manchester, restoring the lost Bateman provenance. The collection's fall from prominence has happened gradually over the years, as artifacts have moved in and out of many hands, but it has contributed objects to some of the world's most prestigious museums and galleries. Bateman's shoes enabled Joseph Box to develop his notable collection of footwear at the turn of the century. This now forms the core of the shoe collection at the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in Sydney. And a small card battle door acquired by the internationally renowned horn book collector George Plimpton played, played its part in founding a collection of rare books at Columbia University in the USA. Such stories captured in the exhibition play out time and time again, testament to a remarkable collector who began collecting at the age of 14 and accessioned his final objects 
four days before he died. Mark is going to tell us about the exhibition. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, so all these ideas and that were percolating for years and years, um, we sort of discussed them. And I mean, I love a mind map because I have a mind that you know I need to write everything down. And um, so this was our initial mind map for the exhibition. Um, and then these ideas crystallised into three um, main themes. Oh, okay, I was expecting another slide, but it's not there. Okay, um, maybe it's further on. Um, so we broadly thought we'd explore three main themes, um, which were... Um, the early collection, the use and um, development of the collection, um, and then the dispersal and legacy of the collection. And within those themes, um, we divided that up into nine sections, which is what we had as the section headings. Um, so we... Um, so we had... Uh, we started off talking about how it was a family collection, because, again, it was all those things that it was... It was known as the Bateman Collection, but it was always Thomas Bateman was the one who did everything. Um, and actually, we wanted to bring out that it was his father, William, who started it. And we also wanted to bring it forward and incorporate um, Mary Gregg's um, collecting activity and work. Um, and obviously, you, you don't know how much it was a direct line or whether collecting is in the genes or whatever. Um, but it, we wanted to broaden it out from it just being um, Thomas. Um, you can see here a portrait of Thomas uh, with his son, and then the other one is, is his wife, Sarah, with, with three of their daughters. Um, we also talked about how the collection began, uh, the, er the early start of the collection with William's um, uh, collection, because in the 1855 catalogue, um, Thomas, um, as well as giving everything a number or every group of objects a number, divided into alphabetical lists and then everything numbered, um, he put a little letter next to it to indicate the source of the um, item. So W were items that had been part of his father's collection, um, P was for purchased, D was for donated, and then he also had C and R, depending whether it had been Samuel Carrington or James Ruddock who had excavated um, for him in, in North Yorkshire and Staffordshire. Um, so, uh, so we had uh, the family collection, the early collection, and then network and contacts, which captured some of that information that Sharon just told, told you about, about dealers writing to him and giving him things. Um, and then we moved on to the development and use of the collection, and we uh, were able to have a whole section on cataloguing and classifying. It felt like a culmination of all my work in museums to finally be able to have a, a display case about labelling, um, which people do stop and look at. Um, we also had a section here, you can see, about the Barrow Knights, um, because that was a significant part of his work, but it says something that out of, you know, there were nine sections, and one of them was about his local archaeology work. Um, Then we had a section uh, which we called quote, Quoted and Complimented, which is, again, showing that idea of people asking him for his opinion and asking him to partake. Um, and you can see on the wall here um, are some of the engravings from the Crania Britannica. This was one of the debates that came up about um, whether to include human remains in the exhibition. There were sort of three points where we thought we could have included them. And in the end, we decided that we would only include um, actual human remains in the Barrow Knight section. Um, and we, uh, if I just nip back a slide, um, you can see there's a wall here on the um, left-hand side. So we physically arranged it so that those human remains were behind the wall so that people could avoid that section if they wished to. And we had a sign at the front um, of the gallery to, to warn people. Um, and it was recreated uh, based on uh, Thomas's um, uh, excavation uh, plan, plan of the excavation. The only difficult, one of the difficulties we did have, though, is that he did not tend to keep all of the skeletons. 
So although he found three skeletons, excavated three skeletons, he only kept the skulls of two of them. And again, that was something, you know, as you are all aware, this is a, a, a question where there's a big, a huge debate and a great variety of opinions. Um, and you'll see here in the quoted and complimented section, we wanted to try and give people the opportunity to give their opinions and to gather their opinions. Um, so we had, if we did have a proper name for it, but I can only think of it as a, a, an opinion gathering point, a discussion point where we put a question on the wall, in this case, do you think human remains should still be kept in museums today? And then there's pieces of paper and people write their ideas on and pin them up. And we've been gathering um, those and, and putting them into a, you know, transcribing them. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, maybe we can get a, uh, a master's or, or an undergrad student to do some analysis on those and see what people's opinions are. I was reading them just before we came today. And there's such a wide variety, you know, it's not even... And, and the justifications are really interesting as well, actually, because it's more than just a yes or no question. And, you know, and it's an interesting insight into sort of people's um, beliefs about what happens to you after you die. Um, and whether they, you know, and some people think it's fine if you know who the person was and can give them a name, and some people think um, it's, you know, it's okay if they're anonymous. Well, those are two directly opposing views. Um, but in this section, for example, in quoted and complimented, we decided only to use um, photographs. So on this lower row, you've got the uh, engraving from the Crania Britannica and then a photograph of the skull that, that was engraved. Um, so as I said, the project meant that we found out much more about the Bateman items in our collection at Sheffield other than archaeology, including uh, this wonderful, complete ichthyosaur fossil um, that um, yeah, we always knew we had, this is it, as people will say, you discovered. Well, we didn't discover, we knew it was there. It's just because we had this project, we were then able to, or my colleague rather, was able to apply for funding to have it conserved because it was suffering from pyrite decay. Um, and then, um, and then it's, it's gone on display and we've had um, a professional photographs taken of it. And it just highlights it much more. And that was m m a, the case with a lot of the items in the natural science collection in that we just realised the extent to which, um, you know, it, the, the, ex the extent of it at Sheffield. Um, we were also able to um, borrow um, from uh, six other museums, items from six other museums, so through Sharon's research. Sh Sharon's research, sorry, we found, um, you know, we knew where there were lots of other Bateman items um, and we successfully applied for funding from the Western Loan Program, um, which enabled us to borrow um, from uh, the Pitt Rivers, um, the uh, Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in um, Cambridge, Yorkshire Museum, the John Wylands Library at the University of Manchester, um, Manchester Art Gallery, yes, they were the biggest lenders, so uh, terrible that I've forgotten. And also, one of the most exciting items um, for me was, as Sharon mentioned, there are 10 volumes of correspondence and letters written to Thomas Bateman at Sheffield, um, but we found uh, a single letter written by Thomas Bateman at, in the Special Collections Library at the University of Sheffield, and they very kindly lent it for the exhibition. Okay. So just to finish off talking a little bit about the legacy. In terms of my research, of course, things um, restored Bateman provenance is a, a, an important aspect. Uh, so many things are held in museums and art galleries around the world that are not recorded as being Thomas Bateman, and that means his profile is diminished over the years. Um, new or extended knowledge, somebody talked about this earlier, that you know, there are a lot of inaccuracies in museum databases, and there are around this collection. So it's good to add and develop further knowledge of exist in existing Bateman holdings. Um, raising his contemporary profile, I was just talking to people um, over coffee, and so many of you 
archaeologists don't really know um, the extent and um, importance of this collection. Uh, and it also highlights global collections. This was a large collection of um, uh, the 1855 catalogue was about 4,000 plus objects. Um, that's individual listings. Each listing often had multiple objects um, added to that. The um, 250 pages of, of later acquisitions, this was a much more substantial collection um, that has connections globally, worldwide. And of course, the ongoing p uh, potential for the research. I've only read, I realize, five volumes of the ten volumes of letters, so who knows what I'm going to find next. Yeah, it's definitely one of those projects that, you know, yes, in theory it will come to an end, the exhibition runs until January, but um, we want to keep it going, so we have a plan to, and I still don't quite know how I'm going to do it, condense the, you know, 20 odd cases down to two. Um, to have a smaller display in our permanent archaeology gallery um, and definitely keep working with Sharon on finding out more. And I would urge you all to go back to your museum and look for Bateman labels or uh, white stenciled letters, often you know, a letter and a number. We can, I can send you examples of things you should be looking for um, because it would not surprise me if you've got something. You just seem to, if it, if it well, not if it moved, if it was for sale, it seemed like he bought it. So, thank you very much.